I'm Suzanne Avet, and this is Alternate Perspective. This show is about shining a light on all things alternative and community-driven by providing a platform for different perspectives. Um, today we're talking about being bloodwise with Ken Baxter. I'm Ken Baxter. You know, I wasn't nervous till the camera started rolling. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> Anyway, I'm Ken Baxter. I'm uh, 52 years old, grand father, grandfather, community activist, have been a community activist for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, blood, being blood wise is, mm -hmm. is something that's very important to me. And it, I think it should be important to everybody because um, being blood wise is understanding that mm -hmm. the blood industry, blood that most people think is just like a nonprofit organ, uh, uh, organization yes. collecting blood and, and helping people out, but the, the blood's a little more complicated than that. It's actually a business. So being blood wise for me is understanding the business of blood okay. and sharing that with other people. I'm more of a messenger than an expert. <laughs> I've always followed the experts and, and been inspired by people that do research mm -hmm. and that are very passionate about things that, that um, they've seen. Um, Blood has affected me because I'm a person who, who used blood products uh, mm -hmm. from the time I was four months old. A hemophiliac, a bleeder. Most mm -hmm. people think of hemophilia, they think that you know, those mm -hmm. are the guys that when you cut yourself, you bleed to death. Mm -hmm. But it's much more complicated than that. If we have platelets that work fine, and there's different kinds of hemophiliacs. Okay. It can get real complicated in description. But it boils down to there was 20,000 people in this country, including me, that had to use blood products, products mm -hmm. made from blood. At one time, it was plasma, okay. frozen plasma, and it took forever to get it into your body. Wow. And then they turned it into a concentrate, a powder. Mm -hmm. So along the lines, this is all Business of Blood provided us our products mm -hmm. in ph very big pharmaceutical companies. All right. And so they provided us with a, a product that got more expensive as the more concentrated and better it got. And so our treatment got better. Okay. Now, we suffered from a lot of internal bleeding, which has destroyed all my joints. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been very painful. A lot of time in the hospital as a kid. It, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it had a very negative effect on, my, on different areas of my life. But I really depended on the ability to use uh, blood. And um, mm -hmm. and that that resource that I think everybody is going to use at one time or another um, has really affected me and you know thousands of other Americans mm -hmm. in a variety of ways. Right. Um, well, you did describe blood products because, like, to me, the first time I ever heard, like all the blood donations and everything cold as blood products was from you. So I was like, I'm glad you'd explain that. Um, and I'm guessing most blood donors are not aware of this. So I think it's a very important part for people who are donating blood to know what they're getting involved in as well. Yeah, a lot of blood donors, they don't realize all, the different aspects of what blood could be made into. It could be, it can go to the emergency room and, and help save somebody's life, or it could be turned into, you know, 50 different products used by pharmaceutical companies to uh, make, to treat different things, which the profit margins can be very high. Wow. So there's a lot of money to be made in blood. And I don't think people think about that. They think of it as, I, I, as I used to think of mm -hmm. it as like nonprofit. People yeah. helping people. That's yeah. kind of what I thought. Yeah. This is new to me. It's, it's a huge business. And not only that, it's a business that uh, when it began, they, uh, they had an issue with hepatitis. Mm -hmm. And, and um, they knew it was in the blood supply. It would have cost a lot of money to, to prevent people from getting hepatitis. And there wasn't a lot of, a lot of effort in spending that money to prevent that. And um, so because it's such a big business and the profits are so, so big, mm -hmm. one of the, how can I put it, profit becomes important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes profit becomes more important than the yeah. consumer. That's not good. Yeah. So, you know, me being a community, I said I was a community <coughs> activist. Um, what happened is, is when I was in my early, early 20s, I started doing volunteer work. 
Mm -hmm. at camps and involved with other people that had bleeding disorders because mm -hmm. I wanted to connect with the community that where we had similar issues. Mm -hmm. And what happened is I started seeing people getting really sick. And um, about that, actually before that, I was actually ni I was 19 years old when I went to a doctor and they told me I was HIV positive for the blood products. Wow. And at that time, they told me that I probably had been exposed to dead virus. And it, it wasn't really explained well to me what had happened. Mm -hmm. I just, and, and, and because of, I had a very bad attitude as, at that age, and so it didn't really bother me. I was semi-suicidal, so I thought, you know, what's the, all right, so I don't have to kill myself. I'll just deal with this, mm -hmm. you know, or I'll ignore it, which I did both. Mm -hmm. um, but what I couldn't ignore is the volunteer work I was doing in the community, and I was seeing kids get sick and die of this, of the same thing I had, that for some reason, I'm a slow progressor. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had HIV for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't start taking any medication until two years ago. Oh, wow. So, you know, and I got it from a product that I was told was safe. Mm -hmm. Come to find out, it wasn't safe, obviously, but mm -hmm. uh, we, um, I just was volunteering, and I was taking pictures at camp. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I knew I, we all found out we were HIV positive. And then I watched kids die of pneumonia. And I saw people, you know, using very expensive medications, mm -hmm. medications that were making people sick. Mm -hmm. um, my, my volunteer work turned into a job where I was actually delivering some of the products that I was using. So I got really connected to a lot of people and kids mm -hmm. that had HIV from blood products. And it just had a huge effect on me. You know, I oh. just really felt... I felt the, their pain, mm -hmm. and in, in particular, this one kid, his name was Rocky Alvarez. Mm -hmm. He was 10 years old, and I spent a lot of time with him for one reason or another. His parents couldn't be there for him in the hospital. Mm -hmm. His life was AIDS, that's all he knew. He didn't even know he was HIV positive until right before he died, because nobody wanted to tell him. He thought that all this time in the hospital being sick was part of, uh, you know, part of being a bleeder. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, the. Uh, the business of blood had a huge effect on his life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it turned it into living in a hospital. So watching him suffer and then being with him when he died, you know, one of the hardest aspects of that was that was huge huge impression impression yeah. on me because we he went through days of not being able to breathe and um, and just not hardly moving and all of a sudden he wanted to get out of bed and he was actually dying. His oxygen level was going down and we had to hold him in bed and just that that whole process, you know seeing that then seeing other kids at camp kids that didn't come back and, and then watching other adults die and then feeling a bit guilty myself mm -hmm. you know living through all this and being a survivor um, i also became a father mm -hmm. which was not something that everybody did and it was, you know, mm -hmm. it was crazy mm -hmm. uh, i in 1990 i had twin daughters that were born it was a long nine months, and mm -hmm. that, and and I'm so lucky that they weren't HIV positive. So uh, at that, they probably kept me going in ways that that other things might not have. You know, my my dedication to them really, mm -hmm. I think, gave me a spark of life. Um, so community activism, um, as a father, seeing kids die, it was really tough, and. Along the way, I kept hearing about there might be an issue with the, there might be more to it than, we were told it was an mm -hmm. accident, that the, that the products but were it, bad by accident, that there was nothing they could accident. do. There was no way to identify that there was AIDS in, in the, uh, the products <coughs> that were being made. I had no idea what the, what the pressures were in the background. We had a watchdog group called, uh, it was like a nonprofit mm -hmm. fellowship uh, organization that watches out for us. as. Mm -hmm people with, that deal with blood products. And I didn't know that they were being pressured by pharmaceutical companies not to tell people not to use products. Wow. Instead, our watchdog group kept saying, keep using the products. There might, there might be some issues, but keep using the products. And, they, and there was a couple of years where oh, they should have been God. saying, stop. You know, it should have been like, you know, Tylenol, the Tylenol poisoning years ago or any there other bad There was a Tylenol poisoning? Po oh tylenol poisoning, yeah, there was, a, there was a time where Tylenol had, uh, somebody had put arsenic or something in it, and they recalled all the Tylenol. They should have recalled all these products. Mm -hmm. Instead, 
we found out through research. I'm not the one that did the research. I just passed the information. I'm mm -hmm. the messenger. And uh, well, found out through research that there was, you know, four companies involved. They were making so much money that they didn't want to take the, pro the loss of. of their profits. They, they found out, they figured out it would cost them less in lawsuits than it would to, uh, less in lawsuits than to throw the product away. And wow. then when they couldn't legally sell it in the U.S., they sent it to other countries. And they actually sent it to camps with kids. They knew the product was bad. So these are the kind of stories that I, I accumulated over the years from very educated and, and intelligent people that did research mm. and were very angry. Well, um, I don't blame them I for was, being angry. These yeah. are children, people, lives, but because of profit, they didn't care. It's hard. To, it's hard to believe, and so that's where it goes back to the, the uh, being blood wise. You know, mm -hmm. if I had been blood wise, if I understood the industry, mm -hmm. which some of the people in the community did, they understood the pressures mm -hmm. and the profit issues. Uh, they actually stopped using the products. Mm -hmm. There was just a small number of people that did that, mm -hmm. and they were managed to not get HIV. Mm -hmm. um, but still, it's like people. It's, oh my God, I, I have no four words. I'm just authentically pissed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe. A lot, so many people don't know these stories. There's so many families that not only were, did they go through the process of dealing with the hemophilia, bleeding internally that destroys your body in a lot of ways and mm -hmm. it makes life really hard, but to throw AIDS on top of that, That's... and then you know a bunch of guys having to deal with AIDS, there was there was it, the the stigma was just it was a had, took on a life of its own. People got had their houses burnt down. People went through all kinds of things. They continue to go through things. There's still people that mm -hmm. professionally they they will not talk about being HIV positive. I've been talking about it since 1988 because mm -hmm. I got very I got angry at watching everybody dying and everybody dying quietly. Yeah. I thought, you know what, I got nothing to lose. I'm kind of semi, semi-suicidal semi about things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there was a time where my, I was able to see my kids all the time and we had a breakup. And so mm -hmm. when I didn't, wasn't able to be with my children and uh, was frustrated with life, what did, I, what did I choose to do? I went to, to be a community activist <laughs> and I took all my energy hey, and I, mean. I put it into that, you know. All right. Uh, I may not be able to be with my kids every day, so I'm going to go uh, be a community activist. And that, I went pretty far with that, you know, because what happened was other people motivated me, other people that understood the business of blood. Mm. And they provided the documents and they did the research were telling me that these companies need to be held responsible. They should be. The business of blood needs to be held responsible. So there's some great hard lessons to learn from all this, that, that anybody facing the, uh, the future of needing to use, we could need blood for anything from elective surgery to an emergency. If it's life and death and you're in the ER, great. Mm -hmm. you know, use whatever they got, you, know, you don't have anything to lose. But otherwise, wouldn't it be nice to know all the facts? Well, to to know that blood is <coughs> blood is considered a service, not a product, mm -hmm. and and that has made it very tough. That was blood. Do, do people need to know that, that blood shield laws exist? Mm -hmm. And every state has different blood shield laws. Mm -hmm. That's another aspect of the business of blood. These blood shield laws were developed long before the big pharmaceutical companies started making millions of dollars on these products. The product that I use right now, mm -hmm. it's not made of blood anymore. They stopped making our products of, made from blood. So I'm, I'm, I'm still talking about blood even though it doesn't affect me anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, it's good uh, that you got yourself out of the situation. Because it's still an, an issue that affects every, every person that oh, needs yeah. blood in the future. The business really needs a closer look. Mm -hmm. It needs attention, and be, nobody wants to talk in, in the hemophilia community. In the early days, the early 90s, everybody was upset. They were throwing blood on doctors because we found out that our watchdog group wasn't doing their job. The FDA wasn't doing its job. Everybody was very angry. I was busy breaking up with my my daughter's mom mm -hmm. and, and losing everything. So I really didn't care about any of it. And, and, and what happened is I it got happens. pulled back in. You know? mm -hmm. I kept having friend buddies that were dying and I'd go by their bedsides or I'd go to their funeral. And um, 
they wouldn't you know the family wouldn't have any money to bury them and I so I would go hit up the uh, local news station and beg them sell it like I, if someone was selling it like a shoe they used to drive me nuts mm -hmm. sell it like a shoe go to a news cat do the news station and say look these people can't afford to to pay for a funeral and you know why and don't you think that's important? Shouldn't this story be told? Should I shouldn't be. have to sell it. You should sell it, sell it itself. I should just have to mention that it even happened. Yeah. And so I was doing a lot of that. Just out of, just my heart going out towards other people. And some survivor's guilt. You mm. know, I, I walk with a lot of survivor's guilt. Uh, yeah, that's... I don't I don't know why I survived all this. You know, there's so many smarter, better people than me that, that didn't make it. Ken, you're a pretty fantastic person. <laughs> I know so, that. I know you for years. That, I mean, that's really that's the truth. That's how I feel about it. And um, I, so I, I have been compelled for since 1992 to talk about these issues. I stopped. Oh, and then it, it developed into something else. I was talking about the issues at first, raising money for funerals, and mm -hmm. then I thought hmm, maybe I could take another step. Then these guys were showing up at. Um, they invited me to a candlelight vigil, mm -hmm. and they were going to Bear Pharmaceuticals. I don't even know if I should mention the name. But uh, they were going to this huge pharma, big pharma, and they were they were they were they were showing their pain. They were talking about there there needs to be a settlement. There needs to be a, an investigation. Mm -hmm. And I thought I went with them. I thought, well, you know, I, I I didn't know that one company was worse than the others, and I didn't know I wasn't quite convinced that it wasn't just an accident. But I figured I'd go pay my respects to the suffering. Mm -hmm. But as I saw these documents and I talked to these guys that were a lot smarter than me, I became convinced. Mm -hmm. And and so when we went to the gates of the, one of these pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. and everybody was was very upset and I started thinking about all the people that I knew that died, the people that I sat with that died, mm -hmm. and, you know, and especially that 10 year old boy, mm -hmm. um, I got very angry and I thought, how can I express this in a way? You know, I was watching people hand out flyers at the, this, this huge compound and I thought, you know, we're disappearing in the background. People are ignoring us. They're not really, we're not getting the effect. They're not living, they're not experiencing the pain that I saw. Yeah. How do we get that across? You know, people do it all, people get, how do we become a commercial? You know, every day there's commercials on the TV telling us how, what products to like and how, how to get fired up about these stupid products or teams or whatever. They're getting mm -hmm. fired up about things that don't compare to the people I watched die and the suffering that I've yeah. seen and, and the elements of the business of blood that people need to pay attention to. So I thought, well, we could do better. So I started getting really loud, and everybody looked at me. You know, other people had been really loud and aggressive up until that point, and they were starting to back off. The doctors weren't getting blood thrown on them anymore. People weren't breaking things. They were getting more, more conservative, and then I was, and I was just coming into it. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty fired up, and so I didn't want to throw blood on people. I didn't want to get aggressive, but I wanted to create a presence, mm -hmm. just like I created a presence at the bedside of those people that were dying. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create a presence, the same presence I felt after I watched somebody die mm. at the gates of these pharmaceutical companies. So I went a little further than everybody else. There was, there was one a big crowd, it was like 40 or 50 people, but then there was a core group of us, about 10 people that kept showing up for about a year. So I kept thinking, what else can I come up with? You know, uh, I'll put flyers on everything. I'll stick it to anything and one, you know, they always wear it. We're, we might get a ticket for littering. You might get a ticket for that. You might get in trouble for this or that. Can't stop it. And I go, no, no, we got to go a little further. So then I painted my face red. And then I started decorating the driveway with the paint of blood uh, all over the driveway. It was, it was water finger paint, so you, mm. you, you couldn't get charged with anything. So I was always trying to figure out how I could walk that line. Then I developed my voice where I can get it up to 100 decimals so it echoed through the whole place. And I didn't need amplified sound. Mm. And, then, and then I started getting buttons of the dead, and I would put it on me. I got a suit, and I started dressing like an executive you know, and with a red face. And I just wanted, wanted to create that 30-second commercial that they couldn't, they couldn't drive on that compound without wondering what the hell we're doing. And see, I would be the attention getter. I would be like, all right, red-faced, yelling with a death mask on my back and, and just like, Rah! but I don't yell at people. I just like a town crier. Mm -hmm. And then the buddy, my buddy over there that's dying of AIDS, mm -hmm. see, he's just dressed simply, very quiet, intelligent man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to know what the crazy guy's doing here? <laughs> 
take some information, <laughs> take some information, and then it worked great. Wow. And then the guys started getting tired of going out there, and uh, some of, and then they ended up dying. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't, Didn't. and well, I kept going, mm -hmm. and um, I bought an ambulance. Mm -hmm. And I painted it red, and I put the pictures of wow. before and pictures of people that had protested with me that they were healthy and when they were sick and when they were dead. I took those pictures because I'm a photographer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen so I life. sent it. I, I used my skills to record my buddies after they died mm -hmm. because I wanted the people at that plant to see what I saw. That mm -hmm. this is important. This is the hard lessons of the business of blood. Yeah, and somebody should care about this. It should be a, a worldwide attention should be on this so, so that this doesn't happen again. And I built, I, I created an ambulance. I, uh, I, I put big stickers on it. I, it looked like it was so good. I did such a good job that people thought it was an ambulance. <laughs> It was oh a God. big red ambulance, and, it, and people, most people thought it was just a regular ambulance. <laughs> so I was funny. so frustrated. And, uh, uh -huh. and then I'd show up at the plant. The hard part was the oh, bear man. employees knew what it was. And I, I got to know a lot of people in it. They would, I would go and I would stand outside the gates of, of that company for eight hours at a time. And wow. I, in huge amounts. I'm in pain all the time because my joints are all messed up. Huge amounts of pain, but I wouldn't sit down. And then I did amplified sound with the ambulance. The lights were going the whole time. Mm -hmm. I created a presence for eight hours because I wanted them to go through a full shift to see that I was dedicated, that I'm mm -hmm. going to put in a full shift right with you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to think about my buddies when you leave and when you show up. Mm -hmm. And some people would come out there, they would get just so frustrated because I'm also using my voice. So they don't, you can't tell exactly, it's so, such a big compound, you can't tell what I'm saying but you know what I'm saying because I've been saying it for every, every Wednesday for six years. Wow. <laughs> I kept dedication. showing up. And it got to the point, they called the police every time. And, the, and, and it got to the point where it was just me. And so when my friends died, I bought skeletons. So I bought 70 plastic skeletons and I painted them red. Then I'd decorate the driveway with, with red paint. And I would do my routine. Mm -hmm. That's what I did on Wednesdays. And so, a matter of fact, the police department was so used to they would they would come and talk to me when they would block the driveway because they were so sick of being called out for one protester. <laughs> they, they made it inconvenient for the company by blocking the driveway and we'd sit there and talk sports or whatever, you know. And they would laugh. Yeah, we're gonna, well, they're going to make us come out here. We're going to make it inconvenient for them. And um, they, they were so used to me coming out there that, um, that they thought I was going to come out there on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Because I think it was a Wednesday, mm -hmm. and they brought stuffed animals for my kids. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we had talked about my kids, and all that. oh, that's so crazy. that's what a routine I created. And and then there was a lot of employees. So what would happen is I'm the town crier, doing my whole routine, honoring my buddies and the kids that I watched die, and using my voice to fill the whole neighborhood with this sound. And so when people get within about 20 feet of me, then I would re I would. I would completely shut it off and I'd say, hey, have a good day. How you doing? And I wouldn't talk about what I was there for. It was obvious. I had a flyer in my hand the whole time. If you wanted more information, there you go. You want more information? That was the whole thing. Hey, you want to know what I'm doing? There you go. Here's the information. Mm -hmm. Take some information. I don't really need to go into it further than that. The information is right here. You can go to the web page and check it out. And then, so, you know, they had a lot of conversations with people because they realized that once they got close to me, then it was just a casual conversation. I'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And that would ease them a little bit. But then there was people that would go, I also had candles on the ground. They'd kick my candles and they'd threaten me and they'd say, you know, I wish you were dead. You should go get a job. I wish you and your buddies were all dead. And those were the hard days. It was, I, it was, it was so hard not to become violent when you knew that you were representing people you loved and these people were laughing at you, they were making fun of you, and they were antagonizing you because they were so sick of me showing up. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't believe that legally I could do that because I didn't yell when the police were there. They, weren't, they were there for about an hour and they'd leave and I would act different, completely different when they were there. I'd wait till they leave and then I'd get a little more loud and expressive. But, um, but there was, you know, I got, at the same time, I had people, um, get real aggressive with me, and then they would feel bad and come back and apologize. Mm -hmm. There was a time where we were, we were demonstrating against uh, 
this company's lawyer in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco. And downtown San Francisco was great because you could use the buildings to echo your voice. I remember one guy came down one time, and I was just saying, you know, we were, it was the lawyers of the company. We were saying these, these lawyers represent a company that's, that's hurt a lot of people, mm -hmm. and you need to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. And we were passing out information. Of course, I was the, the face, you know, what is this guy, crazy guy doing? And then you had the quiet guys handing out the flyer. Well, yeah, you want to know what the crazy guy's doing? Here you go. Here's some information. That's a great strategy. There's a lot of people hurting. <laughs> you didn't know about it. And so um, one guy came down and kicked over my candles and threatened me and everything. And he goes, I can hear you from the 13th floor. You're driving me nuts because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd be there all day. And then he, then I go, I just go, yes, sir, yes, sir, just don't touch me, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, just don't touch me, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, <laughs> whatever he said, yes, sir. And, and then I set my candle up, he kick it over, I'd set it up, he kick it over, I go, yes, sir, and just don't touch me, sir. <laughs> so it was, it was comical. But, you know, I was so dedicated to, to representing the people that I cared about a certain way. Yeah. He came back down and apologized and took some information. Mm -hmm. And that was a that was quite an experience for me, a learning experience. And so I did I did that I did that protesting for ten years. Did um did anyone like try to help you make it more public, or did you try to communicate with like important figures? You, you know. Uh, you know uh, I um. It was so simple for me. I did it. I I not only went and protested out in front of the farms that I picked one company. Mm -hmm. And I asked the people in the bleeding disorder community to pick that same company. Let's, let's just pick one company and boycott them to make a point that we, are, we have consumer power. The, 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 the products I use mm -hmm. right now are $30,000 a month for me to, to keep from bleeding. I use IV, wow. 30 grand a month. So there's a lot of money being made by these companies. And we had a lot of consumer power and I would go to these conventions and I would say let's show our power mm -hmm. and I and I wouldn't tell people they had to do it but I wanted to I would do the same thing at conventions because these companies would come in and put a happy face at these conventions so I would pay the hundred two hundred dollars to go to this convention and I would have a doctor's uniform that says barrycomsdeath.com or something like that mm -hmm presenting the other side and then if somebody and I never really talked about what I was doing unless somebody really asked specific questions I would just create a presence mm -hmm. and and have a little red card we'll go to the web page there you go go to the web page and I would go to their booth where they spent 50 grand mm -hmm. to advertise a very positive message mm -hmm. let's forget about all the people that died and just pretend like everything's okay yeah. <laughs> and I would say well that's let's me present the other side of that it's maybe it's not okay, and maybe you should remember the people that died and honor yeah. them by by not letting this happen again and really talking about the fact that it happened to mm -hmm. begin with. So, but I knew I couldn't be aggressive. You know, I couldn't throw run in there with a sign going, "Ah, oh, you're terrible," or throw blood on people like people were doing at one point. Well. My first year at a national convention was right back to back with people being very aggressive. The previous year. People were very aggressive. So I came along in 97 and I went to a national convention. This one company had spent 50 grand to be the biggest sponsor there. They had a booth. I had, I was dressed in black with red face paint and a black ma a mask on the back mm -hmm. of my head that said that they don't care and ha had my information. And I didn't really say much. I would just create the presence. And if you want information, I'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. So oh. I. I just want to this all this whole situation this happened in what year like this This is 97. Up? 97. I started so. protesting with a group of people in 96. Then I went to my first national convention. My second well it was my second national convention mm -hmm. where everybody all the the companies in this that that handled these blood products mm -hmm. in this community would all meet in one spot mm -hmm. and the the watchdog group mm -hmm. The foundations would all meet and they'd have a big convention, talk about treatment, talk mm -hmm. about what products are available. So it was like a big trade show. Oh, okay. Wow. So at this trade show, they weren't talking about death anymore. They mm -hmm. weren't talking about the people that died. They were, so, they were wanting to get past it. And so this situation, what happened to your community and everything, this is just, this is a recent thing. It hasn't like hasn't been that many years like for historically well, wise it's very recent in historical sense it 
to some people it's recent. To some people, even people in mm -hmm. the community that I come from, because we don't use blood products anymore. Mm -hmm. There's a whole generation that haven't used blood products. So they're like, don't talk about that. We don't want to talk about that. And the pharmaceutical companies that are still run these circles, that's in the past. Get over it. Get over it. How can you get over <laughs> you don't, that? You don't, There's like a whole... You don't get over something like no. that, especially when people tried to... There was, uh, there was settlements. There was settlements. There was settlements. But let me guess, not enough. But they weren't... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody got free medical care. No. Nobody was offered free medical care. Or people were, and people were demonized. Wow. People that went to court, they wanted to go anonymously, especially back then. You get your house burnt down for being HIV positive. Wow. So they wanted to go to court anonymously, and some of these companies would get their name out there so that they would embarrass the heck out of them so they wouldn't go to court. That's uh, so and then stuff. and then when they, I actually went to a federal courthouse one time to to uh, demonstrate mm -hmm. to support a family mm -hmm. they had lost their son and they were asking for 40 million dollars mm -hmm. so I did my routine out in front of the courthouse got my red pet face paint and I'm walking back and forth and just kind of walk in the line this is in Louisiana mm -hmm. and you know I'm, I knew that you know in New Orleans the cops can be a little aggressive so I was watching my P's and Q's and so you know doing my routine and oh. I thought you know what this jury, I don't want to. I don't want to influence the jury, but I want to influence the people in the community. And I thought, I wonder how close I can get to the to the actual trial. Mm -hmm. And I walked into the court. They let me in the courthouse. I couldn't believe they let me in the courthouse wearing a black outfit, red face paint with pictures of people that died on mm -hmm. on me. I went through the courthouse. and got to the next to where they were holding the trial. And this is, you know, again, this is the another side of the business of blood. This family was asking for $40 million for the death of their son because they could prove that it shouldn't have happened or they believe that th this is product liability issue. Uh, I didn't know the jury was in the hallway. So I walked, I walked right by the, you know, it's a federal crime to influence a jury. Mm -hmm. And Everything I I was all about influence. Mm -hmm. Walking up, and the jury was in you know in the hallway for some reason. I had no idea. So this this judge says, uh, Mr. Baxter and the security, Mr. Baxter, step into the judge's chambers. I thought I was going to jail. Mm -hmm. He goes, he's he's a southern draw. He goes, well, Mr. Baxter, you know it's a federal crime to influence the jury. <laughs> I go, no, no, for sure, no, 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 sure. that's not what I was trying to do. I had no idea the jury was going to be in the hallway. I wouldn't, I wouldn't never try to influence the jury. That's not what I was trying to do. Yo, sir, please, don't, don't. I, I'll, I'll go away right now. <laughs> and he said, he goes, you know, that's okay. He's putting his, his robe on because they, I don't know what there's some break or something. Mm -hmm. And I understood later why he wasn't upset. Mm -hmm. He knew that the jury was going to award this, that they were going to get that $40 million, which was a number I was asking court for because I figured I would never get it. Mm -hmm. It would be just a number that it would mean something if it happened, mm -hmm. but they would never give us that much money. Mm -hmm. This family got that. Wow. They got the $40 million, but that's, it was overturned. It was overturned? And that's why I didn't go to jail that day, because the judge knew that the statute of limitations by one day was going to keep that family from getting reimbursed for their son's death. That, oh my God. Because what happened was, as soon as you find out you're HIV positive, you had one year to the day to sue. <sighs> and, it, and, if you, and they supposedly missed that one day. Which, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know the, what the details were. It was just outrageous, but I just figured that's probably why I didn't go to jail that day. So that was one, you know, I, I did go traveling to other parts of the country to, to, to honor families that were dealing with this stuff. I went to settlement conferences. Mm -hmm. There was a big class action suit. Uh, and, and it was asking basically for $100,000 mm -hmm. from all the manufacturers. I, and I didn't even know I could opt out. All of a sudden, see, I was never like the a guy that came up with the idea. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. Let me see if I can expand on that. That was, <laughs> you know, so I'm not original. I'm just more aggressive in certain ways. So this, there was a couple of people in the community that had opted out of this big settlement that's, that they said we'd never get. Mm -hmm. And again, this is, 
part of the history of the business of blood. Mm -hmm. This is the hard lessons of the business of blood that people could learn from so it doesn't happen again. Yeah. But there's no platform for that. Not right now. Not even right now after it's, it's, so many years. So this settlement conference, I mean this settlement, I opted out of. I found there was a couple of people that were opting out. And matter of fact, the whole community, because the, the basic word was by this one judge that was saying, you have to write this judge to opt out of this, nas this national class action suit. And if you don't write him, you're opted in automatically. Wow. And if you and then they were, then it got to the point where they were saying, you can't opt out. If you opt out, you're gonna the people aren't gonna get money. It, it, there was all these confusing, confusing, confusing did, messages from, the, from people in the community, from the doctors that were telling you what you should or shouldn't do. People that were suggesting a lot of influences, and and I knew that there was two people opting out, and people were mad at them. They were giving them death threats, and I go, so, oh man, okay, so, I'm into that. Let's, <laughs> I, I'm opting out right now. Damn, <laughs> Bob, come on, yell at me, threaten me. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a reason to get involved in that. Oh, man, I love you. <laughs> so I opted, I opted out. I didn't okay, get it. Nobody, so I even put my number online and everything because they were threatening a friend of mine. So I'm like, oh, let me get in the way. Let me, come on, threaten me. <laughs> and nobody threatened me. So I even, you know, my, I did, go ahead. So my question with the, the settlement, was that another attempt to kind of try to put it under the rug, essentially? It was, well, they were only offering 100 grand, and then they were saying that you could never sue again ever over anything. Okay, so it was an attempt to So there was no medical the care rug. there. Yeah, there was, it, was, it was a pittance. Yeah. It was nothing. So it was it just was, something yeah, trying, to get trying to sweep you. it under the rug. So I said no to that, mm -hmm. which was really hard because, you know, I had small children, mm -hmm. and everybody else was taking the money. They said that no other settlement would ever happen. I was hearing it from my doctor and the super social workers at... at mm -hmm. Hemophilia bleeding disorder, this particular group that deals with the business of blood has a treatment team. And we were hearing from the treatment team that this is what we should do. These influences from But were, were the everywhere. treatment team also kind of well, influenced they're, by the... Their influence, yeah. See, the, so, I didn't know. I, I yeah. learned when I, was, when I was delivering pharmaceutical drugs about some of the dynamics with Just, doctors and pharmaceutical companies. I, it may have changed since I was involved, oh. but, you know, I did the same thing. I took the pastries to the office, and I said, hey, look, you know, uh, let's go to the lunch. We'll, 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 we'll sit and talk. I wasn't able to offer them a donation to their favorite charity like some pharmaceutical companies can. Hey, if you get 10 people on, if you get, not 10 people, 30 people on this product, this new product that we have, um, we'll donate to your favorite charity, which is, could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. They may even have their own foundation. Who knows? <laughs> I think you posted a video where they talked about one of the the doctors who who mentioned that situation. That like the reason he wouldn't even like tell his patients um, was because they put him in that awkward position. Not awkward position, like, mm -hmm. but in that position where he has to choose his charity or his greed essentially more or the life of a person well that's kind of what happened to our watchdog group the the national hemophilia foundation uh, mm -hmm. our watchdog group in you know in the sitting in the middle of the business of blood um they were supposed to watch out for us unless you know protect us no yeah. matter what and what happened is they ran out of money, they had some serious financial issues, and then they had to re, re, uh, restructure the national organization. And a lot of that restructuring money came from pharmaceutical companies. And there's rumors now that even now that these, non, these nonprofits are 70% funded by far these pharmaceutical companies, so, and, 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 and they try to say there's no influence. So why, why weren't people warned? There was a two-year period where the, the, our watchdog group was saying, keep using the products. It may have AIDS, but you know, keep using them because it's saving your life. We, we had no, options. Please. We had options. People, a lot of people didn't know their options. There was a very small percentage of the community, out of 20,000 Americans, mm -hmm. that knew that they can go use whole blood again if they had to. They can go use plasma. There were other options. They didn't have to use this product that pulled thousands of donors together. All it took is one donor in that 20,000 donors that you're going to be exposed to when you use your medication. Mm -hmm. One person with AIDS and then everybody gets exposed to it. And they weren't telling you. They were saying, well, we're only, we're only collecting so much at a time. We're only vatting so much, so many donors. 
they they brought they, and they set a low number when it was like four times as many. So there was a lot of misinformation, you know. Um, so the, uh, back to the business of blood settlements. Mm -hmm. The, the settlements. Uh, I opted out. I felt guilty. I felt bad. I felt and I felt elated too because it was kind of like a fight. <laughs> well, like come on, kids rebellion. <laughs> yeah, my my suicidal attitude. You know, go ahead, threaten me. I'll I'll opt out. You know, because I thought it was wrong to begin with, mm -hmm. and then there was another settlement. Mm -hmm. There was a settlement from the government. I took that money, no problem. It was a mm -hmm. hundred grand. It was called the Ricky Ray Relief Bill. Everybody was taking it. I thought it, it didn't say that I couldn't sue. Mm -hmm. It didn't take away that right. Mm -hmm. It was just the government saying, "Sorry, we kind of didn't do our job." <laughs> Sorry. Oops. Sorry. You don't get free medical care the rest of your life, but we'll it's give like you. Like we messed up. But here's we'll, some money. <laughs> we'll give you a hundred grand. <laughs> oh my God. What the hell? It's like baby I mean, for people in the Midwest, baby. that was a big thumbs up. Oh but, you my know, God. Other people, it wasn't. Well, so, um, so I took that, took that money, and uh, and um, that's partly paid for the ambulance, and then I threw thirty thousand dollars at a at a at a fellow person that was dealing with the hard lessons yeah. of the business of blood. She was writing a book called Dying in Vain. I was going to be in it. Mm -hmm. That wasn't my only motivation to get that book published. She was trying to collect money in the, in the community to get this book published. And I knew that nobody was going to support her. So I said, here's 30 grand. Did it get At least published? that money's going to, yeah, it got published. It didn't right. really go very far, but uh, it got so published. So it's out there, though. So, but it, I felt really good about that. Yeah. So, all right. So that's 100 grand. And then uh, I keep saying no to these other settlements. I went to a settlement conference where it was very... See, people don't know this. This should be a movie about this stuff. There should be. There should this be a is... movie telling all these... There's so many stories, so much suffering, so it's... many children. Well, and the thing is, like, nobody, like, knows about it. it sh there should be a movie or at least, like, I don't know, a lecture or something. And they pretend like it couldn't have been prevented. But you know what? If they would have taken care of hepatitis C before HIV came along, AIDS would have never been an issue. Now, don't get me into details with all that. You have to do your own research. I did a little just, bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an expert. I just play one on TV. No, uh, but uh, I just get general. I just get the general ideas, and well, I go with like it. You know, you uh, have like firsthand experience. I can get the information if you want. It. Yeah. But um, but it could have been prevented, and it, and and not only that, there was that two year period where definitely the product they. There was let's get there was inner office memos that said, hey, let's get rid of this. We're gonna get this product out there. We gotta get that product out there before the government tells us we can't sell it. Oh my god! And we're gonna lose is, money. It costs us less. Still, lot, it, it's the bean counters that will, is what would cost us more. Hmm. I mean, other organizations I'm sure have done it, but this is this this was so twisted. I mean, let's say oh. Ford does that. They got so many bad tires. They have to or some sort of recall. Okay, there's going to be accidents. People may, may die, and, and they say, well, the lawsuits from that are going to cost us how much if we, or we recall. Let's see. What's going to save us the most money? Okay, all right. So worst case scenario, a few people die in bats, fiery car wrecks. All right. I would rather die in a fire car, car wreck than die of AIDS. Because when you die of AIDS, not only do you, you lose your pride, you lose your, your social uh, 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 social worth in a lot of respects nice. your sexual life definitely changes um, you lose everything not only do you lose everything as far as your sense of human being connected with other people but you lose you know your ability to work and you and you are it's like a firing squad you don't know when they're gonna shoot and you live with that the rest of your life you know they've got a lot of good products now but people are still dying from AIDS yeah but back then, a lot more people were dying of AIDS. And, and look, just you don't know what, you, when your immune system doesn't work, you could die a thousand different ways. And I watched a lot of examples of that. Just, ah, uh, I mean, so not only are you not dying like that, you're just dying any oh, 10 different gross ways you could die or more, thousands maybe. But then the community says, ah, uh, to you. We hate you. We're going to burn your house down. I mean, that's the way it was back then. Yeah. I mean, th there's elements of that now. There's still people, the professionals, that won't talk about being HIV positive. So it was, it was like a curse. It was not only, they, they spent, when they, when, they, when they gave those products away and they said, let's work well, it costs us less in lawsuits, they were p 
punishing people with a curse. Just, I mean, that's evil. People should, nobody went to jail over this. There was, uh, yeah, that's this happened all over the world, by the way. This didn't just happen in America. And I think, I have a terrible memory, but there, if it was, I think it was Japan where the CEOs got on their hands and knees and, and apologized mm -hmm. to the families. And I think in France that people actually went to jail over this stuff. Not in America. And um, so back to, to settlements. Mm -hmm. The hard lessons of the business of blood. I kept saying no, 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 no. And, the, and, and then I kept, I kept showing up at conventions and doing my routine. And mm -hmm. I kind of got away with it. Nobody really gave me a hard time. Ken, we understand you've got an issue with companies. You're bitter. We understand. Well, who wouldn't be bitter yeah. if you ruined my life? That was the way they deal with it. Then there was guys that were really sick with AIDS, and they didn't want to be reminded. They wanted to pretend like everything was okay and show up at these events and have a good time. Let the pharmaceutical companies take them to dinner and treat them to lots of stuff. And here I was walking around reminding everybody, the only guy reminding everybody, because everybody was kind of done protesting. They were like, we're over. We're kind of getting past it. Kim, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I said, well, no. No, we haven't made a point yet. I'm suggesting, strongly suggesting, that we say no to at least one company to make a point that we have power as consumers to pay respects to our dead. So I would show, it, I would show up at fundraisers, small events, and big conventions doing the same routine. If I saw the logo of a particular company there being advertised as something positive, I would, okay, here it comes. I'm going from normal kin to... Here's the other side of that logo, Ken. And, 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 it, and it really didn't make me a popular person in my own community because there was a lot of places that people just wanted to have a barbecue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they wanted to raise money for this local foundation, and they didn't need Ken reminding people of the past. And, but I, I felt compelled to do it because I felt like, you know, I show up at these events and you got these smiling reps mm -hmm. that are saying, we're a wonderful company, aren't we great? Well, let me put my logo on your stuff. Let me put my logo on the bag that your child's going to carry home today. Mm -hmm. Let me put my logo on that little ball you're going to be bouncing home. And I'm, don't think about the fact that that logo represents death and destruction. Mm -hmm. And that that logo, one particular logo, goes all the way back to World War II where we killed people in concentration camps. Wow. There's a history to that logo. And, and, it's, and not only did it kill people years ago in other countries, it came here and did it. Mm -hmm. And that's okay somehow. <laughs> okay, all right. So I had a problem with that. Because of the people I watched die, because mm -hmm. of surviving and feeling responsible, like what am I, if I'm going to survive this stuff, I got to, there's got to, I got to, I got to, I got a responsibility to do something about it, mm -hmm. to say something. And so I did for 10 years. And so one of the other um, settlements, now this is why I said there should be like a lifetime movie. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'll have to get to why I came to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how much time we got. Um, I didn't realize that I was going to be talking so much. Oh, it's okay. This is important information. <laughs> and honestly, I would love you back to continue more. Because how much time we have? Um, I think we're at nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So I better, I better scoot things along. <laughs> God, this is... No, I really, I really appreciate the opportunity. I haven't talked about this stuff well, in, a, this in a public a, forum in such a long time. It's important, Mike. So let me move it along. You know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll skip over a lot of the advocacy I did. I did it for ten years, and then I finally said I mentally couldn't handle that anymore, and I decided to focus on other things. And mm -hmm. so I stepped away from the community. And I realized I wasn't getting the support that I thought I was going to get, mm -hmm. and I was really probably getting too emotionally attached to the message. Well, and that I needed to focus on some other things. So I focused on my children. And then there was this crazy bleeder. Another guy, you, and this is another lesson, in the hard lessons of the business of blood. He, he survived like me. He's been a long-term survivor. He decided to raise money by riding across the country, a guy named Barry Hardy. Hmm. I wanted to help promote him. And he was drawing attention because he was drawing attention to the people that died. And a lot of people weren't talking about that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to promote him. I used my skills as a photographer and follow him and do video. And I came out to Santa Barbara. And I ran into another buddy of mine who was also an advocate. His name was Corey Dubin. Mm -hmm. He was part of the Goleta community. And he had been an advocate for years, not quite as aggressive as, as me. And he really didn't like the fact that I'd challenged him on that. He was more midline. He was able to still deal with the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he, they both these guys motivated me to to want to come out here because they were talking about build a memorial. The memorial as a tool. See, a memorial, a memorial could be a tool. You know, a lot of people say, "Well, that it, this only happened to or ten thousand that that got HIV, um, and and that eight thousand are dead. I'm one of the like twelve, two two thousand or oh twelve hundred or whatever that's left. That's and, uh, still so there's only a few of us left. I didn't even take medication until two years ago because I just uh, or three years ago because I was just determined to let what happened happen. I didn't want. The pharmaceutical companies to make more, any more money on me, and then I was, you know, just an angry guy sometimes about mm -hmm. life in general. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at the same, it's funny because I came to this community to help Corey Dubin uh, build a memorial, to draw attention to the idea of building a memorial, and he was he was having some serious health issues, so he didn't really in, invite me in the circle. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, what can I do in the community while I'm waiting to get into this, to the circle of his life? And, and uh, so I started doing volunteer work at the Maritime Museum at Pacific Pride at the Alano Club, and I ended up here at TVSB. I walked in just wanting to learn final cut, and they taught me all this other stuff. They pushed me in all kinds of stuff. I'll tell you what, they'll do that. It was great, though. And mm -hmm. I've really, I really, they have been very kind to me here and mm -hmm. taught me a lot. And really, I wanted to create a message because when I first came here, I wanted to see how many people I can connect with and network with and draw attention to the the idea of the hard lessons of the business of blood being a being a platform for for people to learn about their rights. There's so many things that people don't know about blood and their rights as as a blood user, consumer of blood, and that could be presented in a neutral way to people if we had the vision is the vision is a huge playground with with um, a, a red theme of course because it represents blood and it has a, it has a, a plaque that says you know bring your children here to play because. Um, uh, let them play for the children that can't play anymore, that are gone as a result of the hard lessons of the business of blood. It's, it's good and sad. It'll have some sad elements, but it's honoring the children, especially the children I watch die. Then you got this pathway that goes to another part, and this, there, you're looking at a wall of names. And there's even a wall of anonymous names for the guys that are professionally, that, that don't want to be associated with AIDS. Just a wall of names to honor these people. Then if you keep going, there's a path, then there's an archway that says, never again. So if you keep going, you go through this pathway, and then there's a museum, an interactive museum that, that walks you through the decades, the good, the bad, and the hard lessons of the business of blood. Mm -hmm. Everything that blood's represented, that's everything that blood has done for for America and the world, and this is a worldwide story. Right now, in in um, in in the uh, UK, mm -hmm. people are motivated. They're very they're trying to get the government to to apologize for what happened, to to make up and to investigate what happened. They're mm -hmm. just they're late in the game. And there's actually a guy that would dress red like me because he saw what I did. I thought that was pretty funny. So it's been ten years yeah, since I've done like that. Like an apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his his dad died. Oh wow! And, uh, it was real. Just so. It was a real honor, mm -hmm. but anyway, um, the museum would be an interactive museum, and it would mm -hmm. be a place for all this research that these very intelligent people that motivated me. It'd be a place to set it down and have a, a web page where people that are faced with the option of using blood, mm -hmm. they're faced. They want to know what their rights are. Mm -hmm. They need to, and they want to know what what this business means, what it means to them. Because it is a business, mm -hmm. and, if, and, and it costs money to test blood. Mm -hmm. The Red Cross has been caught not testing all their blood more he than once. Justified before the Congressional Subcommittee. Do you know if, uh, in fact, the blood was shipped or not? I do not have all the records with me to indicate which of the products were distributed versus maybe expired in-house, but we do have records that they were shipped. Whether they were actually transfused, we would have to go to the hospital and... and um, um, ask them that information. In fact, these records show that recalled blood units from the Portland Blood Center were transfused, including units that had been incorrectly tested or had come from high-risk donors. And if a person is At the time, Dr. Pitoum insisted that there was no danger. Choice. No blood reached hospitals that we feel uncomfortable. Yeah, what is the consequence no of not testing blood? Well, you may get shut down. You may have the right to, to test taken away from it, but you're not going to jail. Mm -hmm. We did research and found blood banks where the CEO would get shut down for not doing the right thing and open up a new blood bank. So there's so much that needs to be put. I'm, not, I'm just a messenger, I'm, and I, I need help. I need, I need a team 
of people and somebody with more money than God that's willing, <laughs> <laughs> that's willing to, 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 to take on something like this. This could be a platform to teach the world about the business of blood so that people are paying attention and it's safer. Mm -hmm. and that people know that blood shield laws exist and they should be changed. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that blood is not a service, it is a product, and we are consumers, and we deserve to know what our rights are. We deserve to know that, to, you know, that I can store my own blood if I need blood tomorrow, that, uh, that the insurance may or may not pay for it, but they should pay for it, or whatever, whatever you're up against when you're, blood is not as safe as people think it is. It's no. not the business that people think it is. So are we? Are you blood wise? That's always my question. That's my question now. You know, I did my thing. I was a community activist, and now, now I do I do things like I show up at, at Oprah's uh, estate, a, a and I go talk to their not, very nice security, and I hand them a red envelope, and I invite Oprah to, to help me, not to give me money, but to give me a team, to give me advice of who to talk to to build this memorial, yeah. to to perf create a platform so the world can learn about the business of blood and not have these not have kids die of AIDS or whatever the blood disease is next. I also went to Jeff Bridges uh, ranch. I have to apologize to his wife because they let me on the ranch. She, I just buzzed the thing and I said, this is Ken Baxter, I have an, a thank you card. And I was gonna give them a, a note, inviting them, asking them for ideas to how to make this, this memorial, to support this memorial. She invited me up and I didn't have a car then. I walked all the way up her driveway, it's like two miles. And I, I knocked on her door, she opened the door and she was shocked that I, this guy without a car was standing at her door. She, she gave me a ride back down to the gate, but uh, I think it scared her. Mm -hmm. and, and they didn't, weren't exactly open to the idea of, in, of talking to Ken about a memorial to people who have more money than God, or at least ideas on how to support the idea of a national memorial that people could be educated, it could be a great tool about, to learn about the hard lessons the business of blood yeah that i think that's like deeply important but like it's <laughs> that's why i say you know your blood wise and you know and i'll keep i'm, I'm gonna give it a couple more years um i, I just want to be able to tell them, i got three i got three grandsons with hemophilia that, that they don't use blood products but i'm their grandfather and, and i have a history with the hard lessons of the business of blood and i want to be able to look back and say i did and to the people that died, I want to be able to look back and say that I did everything that I could possibly do. I'm not that smart. I'm not that gifted. Mm -hmm. But I am passionate about the people I watch die. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? I believe so, but I promise you we'll get you back here. Okay. Because we're going to... Are we out of time? <laughs> we're like... I believe from what it looks like 17 seconds. Oh, 17 seconds? <laughs> like, All right, yeah. well, are you blood wise? That's what I want to know. I'm blood wise and now. if you have any ideas, if you know who can create a web page and, and an architect, we need property, we need a museum, a whole idea, you know, it just needs a team. I'm not the one to do it, I'm just the messenger. It's a good idea and people could learn from it. The hard lessons of the business.